Peter Dunn, who's the chief, chief development officer for the city of Worcester, um, will be here ne next week. Um, Jose Y from the uh, uh, UMass Memorial, he was a nutritionist and, and, and part of the group that's, uh, that's um, helping us with the uh, district grants um, that, 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 are, that are a part of, um, along with Shrewsbury and Westboro uh, and, and, and a couple others. So it's a joint, joint district product, uh, project. On the 26th, um, we have our scholarship award luncheon, um, and I'm really hoping that you'll all mark that date on, on your calendar. Um, again, October 26th, uh, it's gonna be a very, very amazing uh, meeting uh, where, where we, where we uh, invite the scholarship recipients uh, to our club um, to have a luncheon with us and hear a little bit more about, about their experiences. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. The, 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 the meetings like, like this in the past have, have been wonderful and eye-opening and, and they've made me really proud um, to be a member of this club and I'm hoping to have a great turnout uh, for that meeting. Um, so without further ado, um, I'd love to introduce um, today's featured speaker. Um, Alice Corrales is currently the Chief Executive Officer of the Worcester Housing Authority. Uh, the WHA is the second largest housing authority in New England, responsible for almost 3,000 apartments and, and 4,300 vouchers, serving over 15,000 residents. Large number. Uh, he began working for the WHA over 24 years ago. Uh, he was born in Costa Rica and moved to Worcester when he was six years old. Uh, he, he was a, a, a product of the Worcester Public School System, me too. Nice work. Um, and a graduate of Syracuse U University. Shortly after college, um, he began working for the WHA as a temporary, temporary entry-level employee, and since then he's held various positions within the organization, and in July 2016, the WHA's Board of Commissioners unanimously voted Alex to become the Chief Executive Officer. Well done. During his tenure as CEO, um, Alex has been instrumental in moving the WHA forward and identifying alternative revenue streams to reduce the, the dependency from federal and state subsidies. And in only five years, the WHA has grown from, 60 million, uh, from a $60 million agency to a $95 million agency. That's awesome. And has implemented numerous green initiatives, including solar energy farms, LED lighting, and water conservation that has resulted in savings of over $1.5 million a year. Wow, if only other organizations were, 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 were that intelligent. Well done. <laughs> On a personal note, Alex and his wife Megan have three, three children, two dogs, and currently in Riverside and Worcester. So my fellow Rotarians, without further ado, I give you Alex Krauss. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andy, and thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, it feels like it was a long time since the last time I spoke with all of you. Um, and I'm not sure how many of you were here the last time I spoke. I, I know, Barbara, you were here. Uh, but was there anybody else here when I came? Okay, so you, so we have a few say, familiar faces. It does feel like it was, you know, five, seven years ago, and it really wasn't March of 2019. So, you know, it goes to show you how time flies with everything that we've gone through with the pandemic, right? Who could have uh, imagined that? And you know, one of the things I, I will very quickly talk and touch on some points that I talked about last time, but one of the things I do want to be able to chat with all of you is a little bit of some of the projects we're working on now. You know, what is the Public Housing Authority's role in the community today? And what are some of the challenges that we're facing that we have to try to navigate while still being a member of the community and recognizing some of the work that the city's doing and being supportive of that, but also addressing some of our challenges as well. And, and, and I know that can be a, a real a minefield at times. Um, so you're able to assist folks, but you have revitalization of Worcester and we've all enjoyed that. And how do we balance those things? So, you know, and I don't know if I asked you this, but I, but I would be curious to ask you today. So. You know, when, when people sometimes do the word recognition, right? They give you a word and they say, what's the first thing that pops into your head? You know, and then you just blurt it out. You know, it kind of allows us to kind of talk about that. And so, for example, if 
you know, if somebody says Ferrari, right, what do you think? You know, I, I think, you know, a car, I see a car speeding down the highway, and I love Ferraris, right? Uh, never will own one, but, but I still like them, right? Um, but even, even sometimes you get an emotion that may not be a positive, right? right? Um, that somebody may, may think of, of uh, the atomic bomb, right? And all of a sudden that evokes an emotion uh, out of you. Or it could be a political person. Right, you, you say a political person's name, and you have some folks that that will evoke something positive for them, other folks it may evoke something negative. So when I say the words to you, public housing, Worcester public housing, what's the first thing that pops into your head? Affordable. Affordable, okay. Greatbrook Valley. Greatbrook Valley, okay. What else? Curtis. Curtis Apartments, right, there you go. It's funny, a lot of people don't know that. You know, a lot of people don't know that Curtis Apartments is part of Great Brook Valley because they just kind of view the entire property as Great Brook Valley. What else? Andy, what pops into your head when I say Worcester Housing Authority, what's the image that you see? Vouchers. Vouchers, okay. Anybody else? Right, so I've asked this question, I've spoken in different groups, and you get a variety of answers, like, like today. And sometimes I get folks that it will evoke something positive. You know, they might have grown up in public housing and they get out and so they, they think of hope and they think of opportunities and things of that sort. But I've also had folks say, you know, I think of something negative. I think of violence, I think of poverty, I think of gangs, I think of crime, I think, you know, it, and, and okay. And then how do we, I think of, you know, um, a problem that's permanent. So then, we then say, okay, how do we break that down? How do we, as a Worcester Housing Authority, change that message and change that image in your head, right? Because when you ask folks, now, tell me again your name in the back, I'm sorry. Chris. Chris, right? So Chris said, Great Brook Valley. Okay, well, what does that mean, right? You ask folks who've lived in Worcester a long time, when you think of Great Brook Valley, what's the image that comes to your head? For most folks, it's not a positive thought. They, they remember the old days. You know, I recently was talking to a guy who, back in the 80s, he'd spent a lot of time in the valley, and he had nothing positive to say. He goes, oh, that place was awful, it was crime, it was gangs, it was drugs. The police had to escort the fire department in there, and it was just, it was not a place you want to be day or night. And I said, okay. I said, when's the last time you've been there? He goes, 1988. And I said, you haven't been there since? He goes, no. I said, you should take a drive through there. It's a much different place. I can put the image in his head, and I said, imagine now driving down to Como Street, and you see these beautiful trees, you see these black, you know, black gated community, you know, with the black uh, uh, fencing, and, uh, and the, what do you call it, the, the kind of iron, black iron fencing that you see that's very decorative, very nice. I said, you have that. You've got beautiful grass, and you don't really see, be really hard pressed to find any trash on the ground. And he said, wow. I said, that's the image I want to evoke with folks when I describe some of our properties. And so we worked really, really hard to change that. But it started, and you may remember when I spoke to you, it started 20, 30 years ago, you know, particularly about 20 years ago, where we looked at our properties and we saw that we were embarrassed by our properties. They were primary. They were dirty. There was trash. You know, there, there was no control. They were being mismanaged. And so we knew that before we could talk about expanding, before we could talk about um, helping residents get out of housing, we had to kind of clean our own house. You know, it's one of those sayings, uh, before you can start criticizing someone about their house, you really, you know, don't throw rocks if you live in a glass house. And for us, it was that bad. And so that became the first phase, is let's get rid of the crime, let's make these properties as safe as they can. And through that, we've reduced crime in Great Brook Valley, for, as an example, by 98%. So think about that for a minute. I always joke around with my sister. She doesn't think it's so funny, but she lives in the Burncoat area, and I tell her, do you know that more crime occurs in the Burncoat neighborhood than in Great Brook Valley? And she always gets upset with me when I tell her that. <laughs> but, uh, but that's true. I get, the, I get the crime stats all the time. And most folks, when they hear that, they go, wow. I remember, and I might have shared this story before, so I apologize if I'm being repetitive, 
I remember there was a time when my office was in Riverbrook Valley. This is probably, I think, I think Vanessa had just joined us. So it was around 2014, 2015. And I was just looking out the window and I see this, this young woman. She probably looks like she's 22, 21, 22. And I see her kind of running down Tacoma, but you know, she's got sneakers. She looks like she's got workout clothes on and she's just jogging. So a couple of days later, I'm out in the area, I'm walking with one of our staff, we're walking the property, and I see the young woman coming back down again around that same time. And she gets to like the stop sign, you know, Carlson Way, she stops there because there's a couple cars going in. And so I, I start talking to her, but she's got her headphones on, so she takes her headphone piece off. And I said, I just want to ask, I said, I work here at the Housing Authority. I said, do you live here? Just out of curiosity. And she, you know, she's very polite, she goes, no, no, I, I don't live here. Do, do I need to live here to be in here? I said, oh, no, 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 you, you don't. It's a public street. I was just curious, because I've seen you the second time I've seen you kind of jogging here. And she said, no, I live on the Burncourt area, but I love these trees. It's so beautiful. It's a great running, a running route for me that I just like running through here during the day, and then I go up Clark Street to go to work out on St. Nicholas and all that. And I started thinking, I said, you know, when I started working here, if there was a young white woman running down Tacoma Street, she wasn't jogging for exercise. And I mean that. I mean, she was either running away from something, but she wouldn't be caught in that property. My first day on the job, U.S. Marshals were in there arresting people, and I, I said, what in God's name did I get myself into? But to see that 20 years later, it actually made me feel good. And I said, Folks can walk around. You see kids, you know, playing in the playground, or the little kids riding their tricycles and their bikes, and you go, that's what you want. And you want it to be just a regular, typical neighborhood. That's all you want, right? You go to your neighborhoods when you when you were kind of growing up, you see kids riding the bikes, playing around. That's what you, that's what the neighborhood should be. Parents shouldn't be worried of if I send you out, are you gonna get hurt? Is there gonna be something bad happening? And so we work towards that, right? Once the properties were safe, we then worked on the beautification. So that's what we talked about. Not only Bridgeport Valley, but you go to any of our buildings. You know, last night I got a call from the city of Worcester. They said we have a, there's a director of a movie, and they want to uh, film in Worcester, and they're looking for some really dungy hallways, and they thought they'd give you a call. I said, <laughs> Somewhere in there, there's a compliment. I'm just not sure I hear it yet, right? And they said, that, you know, they're, they're filming a movie and they, they, it goes back to like the 70s and they're looking for some real scary looking lights out. And, and I said, okay, well, we don't have that. So the guy said, well, can we just go look at some hallways and, you know, maybe something will work for us. And he went to a few hallways and he said, God, the floor is super shiny, the, the, the walls are painted. It's like, this isn't gonna work, it's too nice. <laughs> Again, somewhere there's a backhanded compliment, right? But the point being is we went to our elder buildings and we said the same thing. If you're dropping your mom or your dad to live there, we want you to walk in and go, wow, this is a nice building. Look at the, it's the landscape and the flowers. We created a program called Neighborhoods Best. And the, the point of that program was, we want it to be the best looking property in that neighborhood, and that's what we strive for. So we're always asking our maintenance guy, what kind of plants and flowers can you put here? How do we make this pop? How do we make it that if you're driving by, you really look at the property? We own a property, by the way. We have 24 properties. Most people think Grapefruit Valley Lakes, and they think of the big ones. We sometimes even, people think we own properties that we don't own. So Plumley Village, for example, people always assume we own Plumley Village. We don't. That's uh, community builders. Lincoln Village is another popular one. You know, we get folks saying, oh, you guys own Lincoln Village. No, we don't. They have, they have their Caravada properties owns that. Um, but we do own 24 properties. And we have a beautiful property over on the west side. If you're down in the Tatnik area, and you're going down Mill Street, there's like a McDonald's before the little plaza there, and a lot of Chandler, and there's a, there's a set of apartments. And I was there years ago, and this, this woman, she kind of resembled, it wasn't Barbara, but she kind of looked like Barbara a little bit, right? And this woman comes up to me, 
And she said, sir, do you work here? I said, I do, yes. And she said, these apartments are beautiful. I'm looking for an apartment. And I said, yeah, no problem. I said, you just gotta go to 40 Belmont Street, fill out your application and you know, get on the list. Oh, no, 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 I, I don't wanna apply for public housing. I wanna live here. She said, how do I apply for these apartments? So I said, well, right, no, you gotta go to 40 Belmont. We do the application process centrally there. You, you don't apply individually at the site. And she said, no, 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 you don't understand. I'm not interested in public housing. I want to live here. And I said, ma'am, this is public housing. And she goes, you're kidding me. Again, that's the feeling we want to evoke. So when, when I say Mill Pond Apartments to you, that image in your head, I want it to be, well, that's the beautiful place at the tactic with the nice cut grass, the bushes, the plants. We want folks to, to see that for, for the value that it brings. So that was the second thing, right? Unification was important. The third thing for us now was we got to focus on helping families. So I spoke to you a lot about our programs, for example, our Better Life program, which was we were the first housing authority and really the only housing authority that put a requirement in housing as a, for residents as a condition of their housing that they had to participate in the Better Life program. Now the program looks at five areas in a family's life and we focus on those five areas to build it up. Number one is employment. A lot of our folks either are not employed, underemployed, um, and they're, they're, they need more income. If we want them to move out, they've got to bring more income in, right? Number two, we look at finances. So some of our folks, you know, their credit score needs to go up. Maybe they're a little bit of debt. How do we manage? How do we teach them how to manage their money? So we focus on their finances. Third is health, right? Is, is mom and dad taking care of themselves? Do their, their kids have their pediatrician? Are they going to the dentist appointments? Because we know that if you're at work, and you're constantly getting called that your kid is two thirds, he's, you know, he's, he's not healthy, you're getting pulled out of work, that's gonna be a problem, right, eventually. So, so we wanna make sure, okay, are you taking care of the little ones, is their health okay? And that's not just physical health, by the way. I mean, we, we also, especially with the pandemic, you've heard, I'm sure, or have read a lot about the mental health of what has happened to folks in this pandemic. So that impacts our residents as well. And it impacts just about everybody in the community in terms of do you have the, the mental health to be able to go out and work and, and do these things so it doesn't impact. So we looked at employment, finance, health. We look at education, right? Education is a big one. If you don't have a high school degree and you don't have a GED, right off the bat, you're not going to get many employers to call you back or even, or even talk to you. So we want to start helping families get their GED, get their high school. When they have their high school degree, okay, what about an associate's degree? What about a bachelor's? Maybe it's a certificate program. Somebody wants to just go get a certificate in a particular field, an x-ray technician or something, where they can make good money, but they're not necessarily interested in going to a two-year, four-year institution. Okay, that's fine too. We can work with them. And that's going to increase their income status, so at least help us get them a better job. And then the last one is personal. So what does that mean, personal? Do we get into personal life? No. You know, we're not interested in, you know, who you're dating and, and you know, we, we don't vet out your boyfriends, your girlfriends, nothing like that. But sometimes things that are happening in your personal life impact everything else. What would be an example of something in a someone's personal life that could impact everything else? Can you think of anything? Child. Child care? Is everything? Exactly. Great point, childcare. Use of drugs. Right, so if they, if they have some kind of a, of a dependency, that's gonna prevent them, and so we have to help them. For another great point. And sometimes that also falls into the health category, right, because it affects the health. Another one we dealt with was domestic violence, right? I remember, this is probably going back five years, four years, we had this young woman, very bright, hard worker, had a good resume, you know, she was just finished her associate's degree, she's ready to go to work, so we had our employment person helping, got her a good job, I think it was starting at like, at that time it was like $19, $20 an hour, which is a great start for her. She was at that point making like $12 or $13 an hour, so she's thrilled, 
Well, she's in a she's in a relationship where there's some domestic violence. She's a very proud woman. She didn't want to say anything. So she's not letting her caseworker know that she's dealing with this issue. And so she doesn't go to work for a couple of days. Now the boss is calling our employment guy going, hey, you referred this, you know, you referred Amanda to us. She hasn't shopped to work. What's going on here? So now he's in a panic because he just made this relationship with an employer and he doesn't want to lose it. So she's making excuses, then she's not going to work. Well, come to find out, she had injuries. She was embarrassed, she couldn't go to work, she didn't. So the domestic violence was a personal matter that then we got involved and tried to assist her with because we knew now it was impeding her employment and I'm sure other things. So when we can build those five areas, we know that that individual has a success of moving out and not coming back. Because that's the other problem we have, right? I could help Andy. If Andy was in public housing, could I find an apartment for Andy in Shrewsbury or, or one of the other towns, Grafton, through, through some good research and work? Yeah, we could get him an apartment. And then what, we're gonna plop Andy. He's grown up his entire life in the public housing system. We're gonna just grab him here. We're gonna dump him in a town of Grafton where he doesn't know anyone. He has no support system. He doesn't have a car. And we're going to say, see, your life is better. You have a better apartment. You're all set. Guess what? Now he doesn't know how to get to work. He doesn't know the bus system. He doesn't have public transportation. You know, he's missing time from work. Now the kids, the child care, all those things start adding up because we didn't have a plan for him. And then slowly but surely, he ends up losing that place, reapplying for housing, and he's right back with us, back to square one. So in order to make Andy successful, we have to make sure that he's got a good job, that he's got transportation, so before he decides to move to Grafton, well, how are you gonna get back and forth? No, 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 I got childcare, I got that, you know, we, we lay all that out, and then that way, when he goes there, he's got all the support he needs, and he's got the tools to be successful, so the, the hope and the goal is we'll never see him again. Once he moves out, he's gone. Now, Andy mentioned in the bio, let's see if you remember, how many, Apartments are we? Am I responsible for? I mean, you, you can't answer that here, by the way. And neither can you, Vanessa. Anybody take any guesses? Three thousand. Three thousand public housing. How many Section Eight? Because I know we talk about Section Eight. What you say? Four and a half. Four and a half. No, oh, sorry, thousand. Four thousand. Yeah. So four thousand. Correct. So total, we have about seven thousand apartments that households that we have some level of responsibility. And then that equals about a 15,000 people when you count the kids and you count all the members. So that's about, you know, 8% of the population of Worcester. That's a, big, that's a big number when you think about the number of folks that we're responsible for. Now, I'm gonna quiz you. Do you know the difference between public housing and Section 8? Anybody? You, I know you know the difference, so you can't answer. Uh, federal government. Well, they're both federal government. Any ideas? Any guesses? Ownership. Uh, yes. There you go. So, public housing, I own the buildings. I'm the landlord. I'm responsible to doing the repairs, collecting the rent, making sure that that building is in good order. I, as I talked about, we cut the grass, we, we mow the lawn, I mean, we mow the lawn, we do the snow removal, we do all, we're the owners of the property. Section A, Andy's the landlord. He owns a three-decker. He decides to let Vanessa, who has a Section A voucher, he says, I'll rent to you. She moves in on the first floor, and he says, you know, let's make it easy. Let's say the rent's a thousand bucks. Vanessa, as a Section 8 participant, pays 300. That's her responsibility, 30% of her income, right? So she's gonna pay him 300. We pay the remainder. The housing authority pays the other 700. So for Andy, as a landlord, he's gonna say, oh, this is great. I'm gonna get 70% of the rent from the housing authority, and I know they're good about sending that check in every single month so I don't have to chase her. If she misses a payment or if she, you know, something happens, she loses her job or something, I'm not chasing her for the full amount, which could impact his mortgage payment, right? If he's got a mortgage on the property, she's, he's only chasing her for 300. 
So in that case though, now after a year, Vanessa may decide, okay, I don't wanna live here anymore. I'm gonna move down to Miami or Chicago or, or even just to Springfield, to another town, and she can take that voucher and take it with her anywhere she wants. So the voucher is a mobile voucher and you can take it and move around with it. And if she does decide to go to Chicago, and the Chicago Housing Authority will then absorb her voucher and they will manage it. I no longer manage it. Because then that would mean I'd have to send staff to Chicago to do the inspection <laughs> yeah, department. And that's not gonna happen. But they'd love to do that, but I'm not gonna do that, right? So that's the main difference between Section 8 and public housing. Section 8, we provide assistance, subsidy assistance, public housing, we own the property, and if you decided to move out, so if Andy lives in public housing, and he said, hey Alex, I'm moving to Chicago, he doesn't get to take the public housing assistance with him, because it's tied to the apartment, right, to the building. It's not tied to Andy. He can't take it with him. The voucher is tied to the person. They can go and take it with them. And then it gets really complex, because the state has their own vouchers, so you have the state vouchers and federal vouchers, and with the state, you can go anywhere in the state of Massachusetts. With the federal voucher, you can go anywhere. You can go to Hawaii if you want. And, uh, and they have a housing authority down there, um, which I'm sure is beautiful. Uh, so with that said, we have those many apartments. Now, we have 3,000 families. How many people do you think in public housing, only public housing, how many people do you think I have on my wait list for public housing? Just a rough number. I forget, it's a lot. A thousand? It's a good number. Anybody have another number? Two thousand. Oh, now we're going up. Do I hear three? Do I hear three? <laughs> right? Um, Six thousand. Six thousand households, not people. These are families. Now, some of them may be one person families. It could be, it could be an elder, right? Because we have buildings that are just for elders. We have buildings that are just for folks who are disabled. And then we have family buildings and family sites. So we don't just serve one population, we serve multiple populations. But it's total 6,000. That's just public housing. The average wait is three to five years. One of the things I constantly find myself telling folks, and I feel really bad telling them this, is I'm not an immediate placement agency. Meaning, Barbara can't call me on Monday and say, hey Alex, I got a family here who's homeless, can you help them? Sure I can help them, I can put them on the wait list and I'll get to them in about five years. Well, no, no, they need an apartment by Wednesday. I don't, I don't have anything. 99% of my apartments are occupied. The only times I get a vacant apartment is when you have your normal turnover, right? Somebody moves out or, or you know, they pass away or they get evicted or something of that sort. But that's just a normal course of business. Now let's talk Section 8. How many people do I have on my Section 8 wait list? The same, more or less? What do you think? The same. You think it's the same 6,000? Yes. More. Don't you know the answer? <laughs> she says more, do you believe her? <laughs> she has inside info, I guess, right? Uh, I guess so. If you're the president, you should know all the facts. Uh, I do have more. I have 12,000 people on my Section 8 wait list. And the average wait on there is minimum eight years, average 10 year wait. So when someone applies for Section 8 today, I tell them I'll probably see you in 2031. And you may not need us by then. So that becomes a major problem, right? That, that, that length of wait, there's a need there. And so we have a, you know, it, it's, it's one of the biggest issues we fight. So, now I'm really going to see how, if you've been paying attention, how does the Better Life program help us with the wait list? Turnover. There you go. Right? Who said that? Is that you? Oh, okay. Sorry. Absolutely. Right? The average, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to date myself, I'm going to go back about 15 years. I was down at Great Brook Valley, maybe it was 17 years, I was at Great Brook Valley, and I'm walking the area, and I, I see a tenant who I had known for a few years. You know, she had been a tenant, and I had started there working, so I knew her. And I said, how have you been? And she said, Alex, things are just wonderful. 
She said, my grandmother is living over there. My mother lives right in this apartment over here. My son has been there for two years. My daughter's about to get an apartment over here. And my granddaughter just got approved for housing and she's gonna get an apartment showing over there. And I said to her, oh, this is unfiltered Alex, knee-jerk Alex. I've gotten better since then. But my initial reaction was, I'm so sorry. We have failed you. That's what I said to her. And she kind of, what? And I said, the system was not set up for this to be multi-generational. It was set up to be transitional when it was built. It was come in, let us help you get on your feet, and then let's help you move on so we can help the next family on the wait list. Right, we're happy to help the next family, but if, but if no one is moving out, what you're doing is you're, it's almost like a clogged train, right? If you have that train is clogged, it's a bottleneck, you can never get these folks through the system because the bottleneck doesn't allow you. There's no output. And so we had a program that just wasn't doing it for us. We came up with the About Life program. And over the course of last five years, we've helped over 100 families move out successfully either to private apartments, they're in the private sector, they might be you know, renting out a three-decker uh, from Andy, or they bought their own homes. Now, to put it in perspective for you, because when I tell people that over the last five years, we, over the, yeah, over the last five years, we have averaged anywhere between seven to eight families buying their own homes per year, you might say, okay, well that's nice. I mean, it's not a real crazy number. I mean, that's not very impressive. Seven to eight families buy their own homes. Well, to put it in perspective, for the past 15 years prior to the program, there was a total of 13 families. So when you do the math, in a 15 year span, you had 13 total families that bought a home. And in the five years since we put the program, we're averaging six to eight a year, that's almost 40. Big difference, right, big difference. And to, to go from public housing to home ownership is a huge, I mean, that's a, that's a very, very large um, a accomplishment for someone. Because a lot of our folks coming in, they're starting from ground zero. They're starting from, they literally have nothing, and so they're working their butts off to then eventually have money in the bank for a down payment, their credit score is great, their debt is great, the bank has approved them, it's wonderful. So, the, the, we talked about section eight. Let me talk about what the problems that we see today. So, three years ago, four years ago, every time I give a voucher to someone, they have four months to go find an apartment. Then, if they come back to me and they say, Alex, I couldn't find an apartment, I need an extension, I can give them 30 days. Okay, I'll give you 30 days, you've shown me that you've been out there looking. If they still can't find an apartment, they can come back and I can give them one more 30 day extension. So they get six months. Every person we give a voucher to, they get six months to go find an apartment. They get to go look up in the classifieds, and the number was that 93% of the vouchers we put out on the street there were getting leased up. So that was a good number. Anything over 90, you're doing well. So we were 93% success rate, which meant that we didn't have to put too many extra vouchers on the street because it's all a numbers game, right? So if you, um, if you have a 50% success rate, that means you gotta put more vouchers on the street in order to fill up your units, right? So 93% we're doing well. People are finding affordable apartments. In just the last three years, that number is down to 68%, 68%. That means that 32% of the people we give a voucher to cannot find an affordable apartment. And then I have to take the voucher and guess what happens? I know you've waited 10 years, Andy, but you gotta go back to the end of the line and restart all over again. I'll see you in another 10 years. That's when you'll get a voucher again. You, you're done. Doesn't sound very fair. That's when, so when you're reading about affordable housing, 
that's some of the issues that we're up against. How do we help individuals? Because when you're talking about the revitalization of Worcester, we all get excited, right? We got the Woosots, go catch a couple games. You got all these restaurants, and I, I sort of don't want to come across that I'm not a proponent of it. I think all that's wonderful. It's nice to see Worcester really. However, for us, we're seeing the impact on the other end. Folks are just not able to find affordable apartments. You know, a, a two-bedroom apartment, now, three-bedroom apartment, you're looking at, in some places, $2,000 a month. Maybe $2,200 a month. On the cheap end, maybe it's $1,500 to $1,600. And in some cases, that might include utilities. Other places, it won't. So for an individual that's not making a lot of money, they can't just go and, and you know. So, for example, like, how do I say it, Janae? Yep. Janae, right? So I know Janae, he mentioned earlier he was a landlord, right? So let's say he's got these beautiful apartments, and he says, I'm gonna charge $2,500 for these apartments because they're gorgeous, everything is top of the line, it's new. And I'm a Section 8 voucher holder, but I only make $900 a month. That's my income. And I go and I look at his apartment and I say, hey, I got Section 8 and uh, I'd love to rent. And he goes, hey, I love the Section 8 program. Yeah, okay, not a problem. I like you, well, we'll rent to you. Well, even if, as the housing authority, even if we agree with his rent, even if we say, yeah, $2,500 a month is reasonable for what you're offering and the location of your apartment, Alex still can't afford it. Because he's only making $900 a month. I mean, that's a real obvious one. How is he gonna pay 20, I mean, because even if the housing authority picks up 70% of that, there's still not enough money left over for me to pay for food, to pay for all the other expenses that come into play. We have to calculate that because we don't want to set up Alex for failure. And so there's a cap. The government says, you can't pay more than 40% of your income towards rent. So if it comes out that, you're, that it's 60% of rent to go to, to go to that fancy apartment, you're denied, even if both parties are interested. Because sometimes you just know that, right? It's just like, we, we know that you're not gonna be able to afford this, and you're excited, but neither of you will be excited when A, he doesn't get his money, and B, you're being evicted because you can't afford it. So that's the rub that we're up against. So how do you fix it, right? For us, it's a multi-pronged approach. Number one, we have to try to help families move out of housing. So as you're helping people move out, you're able to address the wait list issue and be able to help people move in. Now, okay, how do you help them move out? You could build more housing, right? That seems to be always the, the popular answer, uh, which is, okay, we are building right now 24 units that's targeted for the chronically homelessness over on Lewis Street. That's a project the city manager asked me to get involved in. We applied to the state, they gave us money. It isn't gonna, it isn't gonna solve the issues, right? It's not gonna solve chronic homelessness by housing 24 people, but at least it's, it's another resource we're able to offer. But I do believe that there are opportunities to build more housing, and it doesn't have to impede on what the city of Worcester is trying to do, right? I had a conversation with the city manager, and I, you know, one of the, the part of the conversation, I told them, we have a lot of undeveloped land. You know, in River Valley, I've got about 15 acres of undeveloped land. We could develop more apartments there. Be happy to do it. But, we need the resources. We need folks to invest. We need the money in order to do that. I can get some of the money from the state, but unfortunately I can't get enough to, to afford the entire bill. But there are development areas that we can certainly build on to address some of the need. The other piece is the towns have to do more. You know, Worcester gets a lot of, a lot of heat for you know, not building enough affordable housing. The state has a threshold, and they say that they recommend each town be at around 6% of their housing be affordable. 
So Worcester has doubled that. They're at about 14.7%, something like that. So they've doubled that threshold. And we're asking the city to do more, right? Most towns, surrounding towns, they're not even at 2%. They're not even at 2%. Some are at zero. And they say, we're not building affordable housing on our, on our. We don't really talk about that much. Now, for me, part of the problem there is you can build affordable housing in these towns, but there's a whole infrastructure that has to be tied into that. How will folks get around? You know, if you move a family there and they're working in Worcester, you know, there's some other issues that we need to address. Um, but that's one of the biggest hurdles that we have right now, is how do we do affordable, support affordable housing? I know the city's going through their ARPA funding uh, hearings. I know there's some money there that's being put aside for affordable housing development. I think that is important. I do believe that we do need more affordable housing in order to, to soften the dent. Um, I'm not sure what will happen on the private sector. Right? I mean, I had folks say to me that that bubble will burst at some point and the rents will come back down. That might be the case, but when? Two years from now? You know, four years from now? We don't know. I mean, you look at Boston, Boston just increased their rents again. You know, we get a chart from our, from our federal, uh, from HUD, our federal funders, and they talk about the rents that, that uh, Section 8 um, is able, you know, the, the Section 8 rents charge for the neighborhoods, the Boston ones have just increased again, meaning that it's going to make it more challenging for folks to find affordable housing out in that Boston area. And if you look at the rents out there, I'm not really sure how people can afford it. You know, it's just, it's just crazy. So, let me just, um, any questions so far up to this point relative to that? Yes, sir. Is there a time limit where an individual or a family can stay in public housing? Um, the short answer is no. There is no time limit established at this point. For us, within our program, we like to um, try to get folks to graduate our program within five to seven years. And here's the reason why it's hard to put time limits. Uh, it's a discussion that's come up in the past, and it's some folks, it's, it's been controversial. But here's the reason why um, it can be a little bit of a challenge. Let's use, I'll use Vanessa and Barbara as an example. Let's say they both move in on the same date in public housing. Vanessa has a college degree. She's got about eight to 10 years of work experience. She speaks English very well. She's, you know, not in debt. Her credit score is good. She's already ahead of the curve. She joins our program and we're like, wow, you, you know, the only reason she's with us is, you know, she got divorced and the house got foreclosed and she ended up in public housing, but she's motivated and ready to go and we pick up very quickly. Barbara, Barbara's a refugee, just got in from the Middle East, uh, doesn't speak a word of English, Barbara is illiterate in her own language. Her, she's never worked a day in her life. The husband has been the worker and the provider. He's also illiterate in his own language. Neither of them speak English, and they've got four children who are just learning the language. What are the odds that Barbara in five years will learn to speak English fluently, will have a job that pays her a meaningful wage where she can go and afford either a private rent or move out of housing and buy a house. They're, we, they're probably very slim, right? She's gonna be with us for a long time. And quite frankly, Barbara and her husband might be with us their entire life. They might end up moving to an elder-only building later on because then our focus becomes the children. Let's get the kids to learn English. Let's get them into really good schools. And we've done that. You know, we've had, we've had students, kids in the valley. I remember this one young gal, um, she got a full scholarship to go to Bancroft School. We've had kids get scholarships to Worcester Academy, St. John's, uh, you know, the universities, all that, all that good work. So we really do focus not just on mom and dad, we focus on the, on the kids as well. And so my point of it saying is, it's hard to then put a time limit on a family. So what we do is we say, you just gotta be having one foot moving forward at all times. The only time you're gonna get in trouble with us is if you stop. 
if you stop trying, if you stop, if you're gonna sit in your apartment and watch, you know, um, what's the old, the old, uh, and you're too young, I don't think I'm older than you, but, you know, the old days, it was Donahue, right? He used to, if you're gonna be there watching, uh, who, who's that crazy TV actor that used to do a live show, they used to fight on his show all the time? Uh, Three Springer. What is it? Jerry Springer. Jerry Springer, right? So I used to say to the tenants 20 years ago, listen, I said, if you wanna stay in your apartment watching Jerry Springer all day, then you don't join my program. Get out, right? Because you gotta do something. So if you're not working and you're not going to school, you're gonna do community service, right? We're gonna have you always moving forward. Yes. So I get the fact that, I guess that there's a long wait list and, and the system for public housing is jammed up. But what about the Section 8 vouchers? Why is that wait list so long? Is it because of a lack of funds or is it because people don't have accommodation once they get the budget? Um, well, for us, it's, it's the number of people, and then here's also what happens. Have you ever seen um, the movie uh, Willy Wonka? Um, remember, guys, you guys remember that movie, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, whatever, right? So, in that show, everybody was trying to find the Willy Wonka ticket, right? Once you won the Willy Wonka ticket, you had the golden ticket, you were going to go into the, into the, uh, the factory and, and be wine and dine. Section 8 vouchers for our residents are Willy Wonka tickets. Once they get them, they don't want to lose them because they know that if they lose them, they're going back 8 to 10 years. So we don't see as much turnover with the Section 8 vouchers as we do with public housing. So we've got folks with the Section 8 vouchers that are longer than with the public housing. So part of the initiative we're working now, as a matter of fact, when, when, when Andy was introducing me, I saw that I missed a call from, from Council Bergman. Council Bergman is working on an initiative, and I like his initiative. The devil's in the details, and I told him I'd be happy to, to talk to him because I, I like the idea. He has an idea of, we focus a lot on the renters, but what if we could increase the homeowners in a neighborhood? We know that a neighborhood that has home ownership tends to be a more vibrant neighborhood, safer neighborhood, more active neighborhood. I look, I mean, I live in Worcester, I'm over on the Webster Square side of the house. Everybody on my street is a homeowner and we all get along, we, we play well, the kids are great, right? I grew up though in Plumley Village Going up Belmont Street, I noticed over the years how that neighborhood changed when it became all rental market. The homeowners all moved out. You saw the impact of that. And so Council Bergman said, when you look at, it, at a place like Maine South, where only 39% are homeowners living there, what if we could increase that number? I think we'd automatically see that the, the neighborhood would improve, but also that you're not dealing with the rents, right? Um, I have staff. I have this, and it's, it's not Vanessa, but it, the woman, a similar age to Vanessa, she's in her early 30s. She's a single mother, yep, two minutes. Single mother. She makes probably about $40,000 a year with us, right? She's, she's in the administrative level. Her rent is $1,600 a month. And I said to her, I'm not saying this to, to brag, I'm saying this to illustrate the problem and why I wanna, we wanna help you get into home ownership, is because I said, most of the folks that work here that own homes, their mortgage is less than your rent. I said, if you bought a home, in the home that you need, you'd probably pay about a thousand dollars a month of mortgage, and then and then you'd have equity and all that. So, so to your point, they hang on to those vouchers. So uh, that's that's been the problem. So in conclusion, because Andy's got the hook out, and I already see it coming. I will tell you this: the last the last points I want to make is if you're down the Greenbrook Valley, over the next year, we're going to revitalize that place. We're tearing down the administration building in Greenbrook Valley. We're building an economic opportunity center. It's gonna be kind of a one-stop shop where we're gonna provide all the services that our residents need there in order to help them uh, reach self-sufficiency and move out. So that's coming in the pipe. I told you about 38 Lewis Street. We're gonna house 24 chronically homeless individuals so we can be part of that solution of dealing with the homeless issue we have. 
We just uh, are moving into our new headquarters. We used to be at 40 Belmont Street. If you get off Plantation Street on 290, it's the old Reliant building. Um, you'll notice it's our new headquarters. We're moving there tomorrow. I've been there for a while, but the rest of the staff is moving. We'll open to the public on November 1st. And then the last thing I'll just tell you is one of the new things we're getting ourselves involved in, and uh, maybe the next time, if I'm invited, I'll chat more with you about it, is through COVID, we recognize the food insecurities that our residents faced. So we have now, we have about a 7,000 square foot warehouse where we're gonna do 12 months a year indoor, indoor terraponics vegetable growing. And everything we grow, we're giving it for free to our residents as a way to encourage healthy eating, but also be able to tackle some of those food insecurities. So we're gonna have about 160 of those racks um, growing lettuce and other sorts of vegetables. And we're gonna teach our residents in our apprenticeship program how to work that that will become a full-time job for them as well. So, a lot of stuff happening. I apologize, I was a little long-winded. I always enjoy talking, so don't mind me. But thank you so much. Um, and at this point, do I turn it back to you, Andy? Thank you for having me, guys. And ladies, thank you. Before, before you go anywhere else, um, as, as a token of our appreciation, Hope to present you with, with the rubber pen of distinction. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Love it. And thank you again. This is great. I always enjoy talking about the Housing Authority whenever I can. And if at any time any of you, you know, want to come down, chat, take a look around, I'm a phone call away. You know, and Barbara has my info as well. So I always enjoy having folks uh, take a look at our properties and then see the difference of where we once were. Part of our new building, one of the things we're going to put on there is a historical timeline. So the entire wall will be Housing Authority first was built in 1949 and give you kind of a whole photographic timeline including the tornado in the 50s all the way to today so it's a nice way for folks while they're waiting they get to learn a little history about the Housing Authority. Can I just so, ask one question? Yes. What is the relationship with the Worcester Housing Authority and the City of Worcester? Great question. I get that asked all the time. Mm -hmm. People sometimes will say to me, I don't like your answer, Mr. Corrales. I'm going to call the mayor. I'm going to call the city manager. I said, not a problem. I said, I have their number. I'd be happy to dial the number for you. I'm like, they're not my bosses, you know? So uh, I said, now, if you told me I'm going to call your chairman of the board, that's a different story. But uh, we are not... Uh, we are not a municipality. We are not under the Worcester's charter. So we don't report to the city. We're not governed by the city. We're not managed by the city. We have our own board of commissioners. Now, where the city plays a role is that the city manager does select four of my board members. So he appoints four commissioners and the governor appoints one of my commissioners. So. We, we have a great relationship with the city, but when people say, well, if the city's doing it, do you have to do it? We don't. We, we talk a lot, there's a lot of guidance there, um, but we are not governed by the city. Um, and so that's, you know, just so folks truly understand it. We're our own separate, separate government entity. How many on the board? So we have just five commissioners. We have uh, just a board of five. Uh, they have a five-year term with the option to renew for another five-year term. Uh, and it's a really good board. I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a vibrant board. You know, you have some members that you probably would remember. Um, District 5 City Council from years ago, Bill Eddy. I don't know if anybody knows yeah. Bill Eddy. Yeah. Bill's one of my board members. Um, Joe Carlson, he was, uh, he's the, the union uh, appointee. Uh, he's also the husband of uh, Candy Carlson, so I don't know if you know District 2 Councilor Carlson, that's her husband, um, which you'll probably say, I never, not, I never thought I'd be referred to as Candy's husband, but you know, I said, all right, that's okay, and so, um, but yeah, it's a great board, they're very, very, you know, these programs, they push them, they're constantly encouraging us to do more, so they're a very active and, and innovative board, which, which is great. Where would your budget come from? The city, the state, federal government, yep. all the above? So, federal government, um, it, it's a big chunk. Oh, that's okay. Uh, our federal government uh, gives us a big chunk of the subsidy. 85% of our units are federal. So that's where the chunk of it comes from HUD. 
Um, we do get state funding from the Department of Housing and Community Development. We refer to them as DHCD. And then the rest is through our own grants. You know, we, we raise a lot of money through, we have a nonprofit instrumentality. And, and through that, we're able to go and get grants, whether it's for programs, for staffing, for the terraponics. You know, so the city of Worcester is giving us money for this terraponics program. Um, so we kind of kind of turn over every rock we can. And then like the solar program is a great example. We turned over all of our electricity into solar. And so because of that, it, it generated a million dollars to our, to the housing authority that's unrestricted and why that's important is when you have a million dollars that's unrestricted is you can do whatever you want with it you can get really creative versus the state and the feds are very restrict in in what you do with their funds where even what pot within uh, all the pots that you can use it yes sir one question what you just said the amount of people on your board you mentioned four from the city one from the state and then you had five is that what you said no it's a total of five so four of them are appointed by the city manager i should say by the city council the city manager recommends them to the city council and they appoint them and then one member is appointed by the governor so our uh, our state appointee is joe capone i don't know if you know joe capone um, I know he was in very much involved at the East Side Club down. He used to own the old golf range on Shrewsbury Street, back in the old driving range, back in the old days. But, uh, but yeah, he's our state appointee. Oh. So yeah. you don't have any from the organization on your board? No, we, we don't have any staff on the board, no. no. So now our, our nonprofit does have um, the, a mirror board to our housing authority. Um, but you do want that separation because they're voting on things that could be a conflict of interest, right? Yeah. If I'm on the board and I'm voting on my, on my contract, that would be kind of a conflict of interest, so. Okay. Good. Sorry, Andy. Don't be, don't be. I won't charge you for the overtime. <laughs> <laughs> I won't charge you. <laughs> yeah, don't charge me. <laughs> but, but we appreciate it because it, it, it was all good information. Um, Alex, on behalf of the club, um, thank you so much for, for, for your time tonight. We, we, we greatly appreciate it. Uh, before everyone takes off, Chris, let, let, let's, let's um, have someone besides me since I was the last couple, I went the last couple times. Yeah, Bob. All right, pull my hood off. Thank you. Five, two, eight. Hey, it's me! Hey. Hey. Uh, I think that was rigged. Uh, right. <laughs> Could have been. I was folded. I'm wondering why. Yeah, Chris is smart. Alright, the clock is here, bro. What is the plan now, sir? 178. 178, a few weeks and growing. Yeah. As we go forward today, my friends, let's, let's consider how we can serve to change lives and consider the four-way test as well. I will not be able to do this time. Have a great week. Thank you so much.